It's peace, shalom, once again. This is part two. The Bible and Summa. Now, I wanted to just go over a couple of maps for edification purposes. This here is the Persian Gulf, still in existence to this day by the same name. Here we see Summa. Here we see Ur. Here we see Akkad. And Mutbal. And as we go further up, we see what is referred to as stated from before, Mesopotamia. Now, a lot of people who are considered themselves, no offense intended to be scholars, will say that Ur or Ur was not the name of the city then. So Ur or Chaldea is a myth. But what you have to understand is just like in New York, if somebody didn't know that the place that's called New York today is called New York today, they would still say New Amsterdam. And if they didn't know about it being called New Amsterdam, they would have referred to what we call New York City today as Canarsie. So you can have the same name that, or you can have the same place that's named by different names at different times by different people. So that's where it boils down to in the Bible where it says, in all thy getting, get understanding. So now I wanted to go over that aspect right there. So the next um, thing to point out and going over some of these maps for edification purposes, we see once again Mesopotamia and the land of Ur and Uruk. And once again, boom, here we see Babylonia. The point in that is because earlier in the presentation, in part one, we read that the people of the Babylonians took over and conquered the people of the Sumerians. So... Now, when we read in the scriptures that Ur of Chaldea is where Abraham came from, we can go there now. Let's go, if we will. We're going to get to some maps later. We can go into the scriptures in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, if we will. We are in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. So that way we can let this be known and understood. All right. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. And he went forth with them for Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came into Haran and dwelt there. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out is when you look at the map, right, for instance, this one right here came from Ur of the Chaldees, Babylonia, and then went, later on we'll see, into the land here of Haran. So looking at it from a broader sense, he came from southern Iraq, went up, boom, here into the land of Haran, and they dwelt there. Now in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 12, it tells you that Abraham left from the land of Haran and went into the land of Canaan. And when he went to the land of Canaan, it says distinctly that, that the Canaanite dwelt there then in the land. So he didn't do what Columbus did and come to where people lived already and said he discovered anything. You understand? The, the scripture distinctly states that when he got to where he was going, that there was people already there. All right? Now, I hope this is being known and understood in the presentation. Okay, let us continue. Brothers and sisters, we can now go to the reference point. I'd like to go into the scriptures, if you will. Genesis chapter 14, verse 13. Because this right here gets into another subject matter about the Bible and Summa. Because remember, we distinctly read that the Sumerians were considered by the Hebrews to be their ancestors. 14 verse 13 of the Bible, and it reads as such. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he had dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol and brother of Anir, and these were confederate with Abram. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out is that it was called in the land of the Amorite. And he, Abram, was called the Hebrew. Now, Hebrew in Hebrew itself is Ebri. All right? And 
the Ebrim are the Hebrews. Now, when you go into certain other references, such as the um, author David Roll in his book, Pharaohs and Kings, he explains that the people who were called Hebrews were called by different names by different people. Some of those names as, as the Kabiru, some of them names as the Apiru, and so forth and so on. So that right there just goes to show that who is who. The Akkadian people called the people who were called the Hebrews the Kabiru. The Egyptians referred to them as the Apiru. You understand? And so now the Egyptians also referred to their people who were called the Karimen. Also, and we, when you go into the writings in the papyrus of Ramses II, let the oil and stone be carried by the Apiru. So this is also mentioned by Hatshepsut of Egypt. This is also mentioned by the Pharaoh King Thutmose III. So doing what you refer to as the 18th dynasty of Egypt, you can refer to this on your own reference. You will see many references of the people called the Apiru. And so what I'm presenting, brothers and sisters, emphatically concerning the history, Summa, in the Bible, part two, is that the bricks, remember from part one, that was used, to build what we understand as the Tower of Babel. Those same skills that those Western Asiatic people had when they went into the land of Egypt, you will find out when you read Sir Adam Gardner's book entitled Egypt of the Pharaohs that they used mud brick things to build what is referred to as the mud brick pyramids of Senusrit I and Senusrit III. All right, now, speaking of those pharaohs, we're speaking about the 12th dynasty of Egypt. So, Archaeologists have found, like the gentleman who called himself um, Sir Alan Flint, Sir Petrie Flinders, pardon me, when you research his work and find out that the issue of using bricks was used in what is referred to in historical timeline as Egypt's Middle Kingdom. That is culminating in what we refer to as Dynasty 12 as well as Dynasty 13. All right, so what happens, unfortunately, is that people try to take Manetho's record of the Egyptian timeline and then try to correlate it with the Bible timeline precisely and such will never match up. And so this is why you find people saying that there were different pharaohs who were mentioned in the book of Exodus. Some of those names were Neferhotep, Dudimos, Ramses, Tut, as well as um, Akhenaten. But meanwhile, the scriptures itself doesn't name any one particular pharaoh that was going to be mentioned in the book of Exodus. So that particular subject we have to then use inference to other sources and so forth and so on. So this is, becomes important because now you see what is referred to in history as the Brooklyn Papyrus. Now, when you go into other secular sources, when you read about the Brooklyn Papyrus, not the medical one, we're talking about the other one in reference about the Asiatic slave that was in Egypt. These, some of these same ones were made as house slaves, domestic slaves, if you will, and some of them also were also made to serve as brick makers because the Egyptians used the skills that the Hebrews brought with them from the land of Asia into Africa or into northern Egypt in this case to the Egyptians benefit themselves. Now one of the things I wanted to point out is that remember we were speaking before in part one about the stones that were used for the pyramids in the old kingdom of Egypt and they still standing and when you look at all of the pyramids from the 12th dynasty that is to say the Middle Kingdom, they are not even intact as the buildings and the structures made of stone from those that were made before Dynasty 12 because stone can withstand a lot more than bricks can. So that's why they're able to find more archaeological references of the Old Kingdom than that of the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. Okay, now another issue to point out, brothers and sisters, concerning this matter is the fact that the pharaoh who started Dynasty 12 was Amenhotep the I called Amenemes in the Greek. And what he decided to do is build what they call the walls of the prince. And he built what is called the walls of the prince to keep out and to repel the people who were called by the Egyptians the Amu, A-A-M-U. And the Amu were a term used by the Egyptians and loosely meaning the Asiatics. So if he started Dynasty 12 to get rid and his mission to get rid of the in infiltration or the, some scholars call the invasion, another subject, of the people who are called the Amu, what has to be known then and understood is that the Asiatics had to have been in Egypt prior to him building what they refer to as the walls of the prince for him to even have a heart to even want to build it in the first place. All right, now, 
if we can, let's know and understand that the Hebrews, like Joseph in the Bible, when he said, indeed, I was thrown from the land of the Hebrews, the Hebrews were a conglomerate of people, and it was not just one set people, all right? So that right there is very, very important to let it be known and understood, all right? I have the book for a reference. Let's go now into the book of Josephus. We are in Josephus. Book 2, chapter 7, verse 4. And then mine is on page 54. But let's go on. It says this. I think it necessary to mention those names that I might disprove such as believe that we, meaning the Israelites, that we came not originally from Mesopotamia, but are Egyptians. So he wanted to point out in his writings that the people in his day and time thought that the Israelites came out of the Egyptian line and stock and seed line of, of those people. And what Josephus was stating is that, no, we don't come from the Egyptians stock and line of people. We come from the people of Mesopotamia. So let that be known and understood that even in the ancient world, the Greeks and Romans referred to or thought that the Israelites were the people who came out of Egyptian stock of people. Now, one thing to point out is not to be racial. The ancient Egyptians were black. So obviously, you have to know and understand that um, when they thought the Israelites were from Egyptian stock of people, that the Israelites were of color themselves. Okay, now, another subject concerning this matter right here is that if we can go into a Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary on page 65, we see the following. On page 65... Zondervan Compact Dictionary, sorry, under Hebrew. Here's what we read, not page 65. It's under the title of Hebrew, okay? And here's what we read. Wanted to let it be known and understood certain things, all right? Hebrew or Hebrews. Designation for Abraham and his descendants, the equivalent of the Israelites. Abraham is first in the Old Testament to be called the Hebrew. Origin of the word is uncertain by certain people. May be same as Habiru of Armana tablets. May come from Eber, the father of Peleg and Joktan, Genesis chapter 10. Or from the Hebrew root word meaning to pass over. From the crossing of the Euphrates by Abraham. Now I wanted to sit there and let that be known and understood. Now, for clarification purposes, brothers and sisters, the people who were called the Hebrews, as stated, was not just one set of people. It was a conglomerate of people that was used as a name to them by others. That is why when you go to 1 Samuel chapter 5 in the Bible, it says that the Philistines called the Israelites the Hebrews. Okay? Now, when you go in Genesis chapter 50, when they was going to bury Jacob, the Canaanites in Genesis chapter 50 is recording as saying, oh, there's a great cry in the camp of the Egyptians. So the Egyptians and the Hebrews in history by others were mistaken as one another. So let that be known and understood. All right. Now, wanted to go over one more salient point. And that is this part right here. This in history is referred to, brothers and sisters, as the Lachish letters. Now, in this portion right here, referred to as the Lachish letters. This is dated Lachish letter 4. Contains correspondence in Hebrew between Lachish and his military outposts during the time of the Babylonian invasion of Judah, 588 BCE. That is the 6th century BCE. And a correspondence was when they were speaking back and forth. These are two things that were found. Other books have even bigger pictures and translations of the Lachish letters. So the point of going over that is for anybody who tries to sit there and ask, well, where do you see any references about Hebrew before 300 BCE? You can tell them to refer to the Lachish letters. Shalom for part two.